What a great song. And I've noticed, I guess, for the first time, all the alls. If you want to be objective in the first verse, what's the hope of any sinner out there? What All their stains, all their guilty stains can be washed away. And then you can make it subjective in the second verse. You can wash all my sins away. And how long will it be effective? Till all the church of God be saved to sin no more. What a great song. I believe it honors God. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah, please. Chapter number 34. And Lord willing, we'll commence with the 16th verse of chapter number 34 and read through the 35th chapter, which is 10 verses. Isaiah 34, 16 through 35 and verse number 10. We've already had a teaching session this morning and Brother Jamie didn't bring us any headlines and newspapers. He didn't bring us any self-help books. He read from the Word of God and taught the Word of God. And we're about to launch into the preaching part of the service where our pastor will preach to us the Word of God out of his book. So I'm trying not to lift this out of its uh, context, but I want us to read this, and don't read this as a prophecy in the book of Isaiah. Read this as for you today. I like what Brother Jamie says. Don't put it somewhere else. Put it here. And we're going to read out of the book of the Lord right now. And this passage begins with seeking out the book of the Lord. So read that. Read that together with me orally, please, with that in mind. Isaiah 34, 16 through 35 and verse number 10. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate. For my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them. And he hath cast the lot for them, and his hand hath divided it unto them by line. They shall possess it forever. From generation to generation shall they dwell therein. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them. And the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of dragons, where each lay, shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Amen. Let's stand together, please, and sing number 377 as we worship the Lord with our giving. 377. <clears throat> J. 
We know, Lord God, that you're faithful. We know, Lord God, that you are too good to do wrong and that you're too wise to make a mistake. And that, uh, Lord God, that you have a people, that you put the burden in our hearts to pray, and it's not up to us to see any results, Lord God, but it is of your good pleasure to accomplish your holy will. Yes. Lord, now we ask your blessings on our pastor as he yes. preaches the word of God to us. Yes. Lord God, yes. fill him with your spirit, empower yes. him. Uh, Lord God, to proclaim the message that you've given him this morning. And Lord God, we just thank you. Oh God, how good you are to us, Lord. And we thank you and bless your holy name. Lord God, let us glorify you together, Lord God, in all that we do and say and think. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you to turn in your Bibles to the 21st chapter of the book of Luke. We want to study today. We'll begin reading with verse 5 and read a lengthy portion down through verse 28, speaking to you from the passage under the heading of the two words in verse number 8, Take Heed. This passage of Scripture, as all passages of Scripture do when considered just with the casual reading and contemplating the words in our mind, they pose a great dread <coughs> upon the spiritual man when he can't get into them. But as the Lord is gracious to do, he opens up the scriptures to us and help us to come and see the spirituality of the word by opening up our hearts to perceive it. And this particular passage of scripture has been so butchered and so mispreached and misinterpreted for so many years that it puts additional stumbling stones before the mind of anybody who has a responsibility to stand and say, this is what God is saying here. So I wrestled long and hard with the Lord this week until the Lord had smitten my flesh and caused me to be called by a new name and identified me in accordance to his will and not me trying to identify him according to my need to preach to you. And it's like Joshua's man in Joshua chapter 5. He saw a man with a sword in his hand, and he asked the wrong question. He asked, are you for us or for our enemies? As if Joshua and his ministerial responsibilities were the utmost and the main thing. And the man, turning out to be a prefiguring of the Son of God, got Joshua straightened out, and he said, I didn't come to take sides with you or with them. I came to take over everything, and I want you to get in line behind me and take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground. Dear soul, oftentimes our greatest problems are our wrong questions that we ask God shaped by our spiritually uh, taught flesh. You bring your flesh, I bring my flesh to church with me every time we come. Every time we read our Bibles, we have our flesh with us, and we've taught our flesh, you're not going to be doing this, that, and the other like the worldlings do. You're going to have to be confined to a world of religion. And so that flesh says, okay, I'll adjust to that. And so we go before God and say, Lord, you got to help me with these verses because i got to stand up and preach them to the people. And God said, no, that's, that's the wrong attitude. I don't have to help you at all other than the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. But what you've got to do, not me, but what you've got to do, son, is you've got to lose yourself in a consciousness of God Amen. and in a consciousness of the spirituality of the Word. And you've got to become nothing 
And by the way, it's not your responsibility to carry that word to my people. It's my, my responsibility to carry it through you. Take off my hat, take off my shoes, bow and worship, holy ground. That's how it's supposed to be. Why are you saying all this? I want you to know that if you hear, if you hear anything that's edifying today, every bit of it, the glory and the praise should go to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want to pray about me regarding what you heard, say, thank you, Lord, that you can take a crooked stick and draw a straight line with me. Thank you, Lord, that you helped that poor sinner and you didn't forsake him like our brother's lesson was this morning. We studied the four, fifth and sixth verses this past Wednesday night, and we looked at the words in verse 6, these things which ye behold. And they were looking at the external glory and beauty of Herod's temple. And it says in verse 5 of Luke 21, And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, As for these things which ye behold, the other gospels render it, Are these the things which ye behold? I can't believe that y'all are just looking at this, this uh, architecture. The days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. That must be very shocking to the mind of the uh, Jewish believer. Let's go back to 1 Kings 9 and let me show you how shocking that was. 1 Kings chapter 9 and verse number 3. Solomon has finished dedicating the temple. He has asked God that wherever the people were, whether they were in battle or wherever they were, a foreign country, that when they turned towards this uh, temple, the Lord would hear and answer their prayer. And in the next chapter, in 1 Kings chapter 9, we have the Lord giving uh, his response uh, to Solomon. And it says in verse 3, And the Lord said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication that thou uh, hast made before me. I have hallowed this house. Now Solomon's temple was not Herod's temple, but that was the uh, temple that they had in Christ's day was Herod's temple. I have hallowed this house which thou hast built to put my name there forever. And mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. Now, the rabbis taught the Jews that the, one of the reasons that the earth was created was to house the temple of God in Jerusalem. That's how strong they believe that. They were pretty close to the truth because if you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the apostle Paul said the reason the earth exists is for the Christian, which is the temple of the Lord. All things are yours, church, whether life or death or any other thing. Everything's been created by him and for you so that you may act out your faith on the arena of creation on planet earth. So they were right about God creating all things for the revelation of his glory, but they were wrong in that they invested the the uh, totality of God's glory to be invested in nothing but that spiritual, excuse me, that physical house there. They couldn't see the spirituality of it. And so when Jesus says this in verse 6, it's got to be very shocking to the mind of those Jews who had been taught all of their life, and so had their fathers, and so had their grandfathers and great-grandfathers, and all the way back they had been taught that God dwells in that temple. We have a lot of Baptist Jews today that think that God dwells in the building they call the church. But dear soul, we've studied very exclusively this past Wednesday night in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 6, 2 Corinthians 6, I believe it was, John chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, that the temple was both the body of Christ physically and the spiritual body of the church. So when God says, I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you that this temple is going to be thrown down, they thought that it could not be, or if it was, it had to be then the end of the world. Because the temple was to them to last throughout the entire world. 
So if Jesus was talking here of the end of the temple, he had to be talking about the end of the world. And Matthew 24 uh, translates this passage differently and the questions that the apostles uh, ask, ask him. Uh, and he says uh, in Matthew 24 and verse number 3, after he says this in verse number 2, no stone was left upon another. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So in their minds, the destruction of the Jerusalem temple built by Herod had to be a prophecy and a prediction of the Lord Jesus Christ of the end of the world. But it wasn't so. The Lord, if I can get into it, and I hope it's got into me, is going to provide you with the rare instruction through this chapter, and I appreciate what both, both Brother Jamie and Brother Gary have said. This is not a history lesson. This is your bread, and, 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 and this, this, this is your sustenance. This is your bread and wine. This is what you need to live on. If you don't have a Grace Baptist Church, if you never see me again, if we never get to meet again, if this message is in your heart, the downfall and the annihilation of America as a nation under God will not affect you. You will have given you today what it is like to think that if our nation falls, it has to be the end of the world. And God said, I'll slide right on by that without even changing gears. It won't even bother me. You're going to lose everything you think that you know is of God. You're going to wind up in the fifth chapter of the book of the Revelation, represented by the man John as a nation weeping and saying, the Old Testament is fulfilled. What do we do now? The temple is destroyed. What do we do now? The priesthood has now changed so that individual Christians now become generations of kings and priests. We can no longer go approach God on the, uh, on the blood of bulls and goats. The relationship of humankind with, with animal husbandry is entirely changed. What are we going to do? And the answer comes back from heaven, quit crying. Weep not. It may be the end of everything you ever knew, but it ain't the end of God. And God's just changing gears and going on with this thing, dear soul. So what you're going to get today is a lesson spiritually of how you are to uh, abide in the devastation of the downfall of America and the downfall of the Christian church in America. Welcome to post-Christian America. And how you are to abide. You are to look to him who is on the throne. Look at the line of the tribe of Judah. And, and I beheld and looked, and I saw a lamb as it has been slain. There's your future, there's your present, and that's all the past you ever had, whether you had a building or not a building. All you ever had was Jesus. Amen? I am not here to teach you a history lesson. You got the wrong Joe if you think I'm going to do that. I don't have the, the smarts and the intelligence to be able to, to discern and rightly divide all the historical ramifications of this chapter, neither can I break it down for you like good old Dr. Bottle Stopper and bring it to you in a nice little package. But I do believe with all my soul that I'm sent of God today to bring you a message as how you are to live in these vicious days in which we now dwell. Boy, that fellow ought to be shot. Or he ought to be listened to. There ain't no in between when a fellow says, I got a message from God. You either shoot him as a liar or you listen to him as a messenger of God. It's your decision. It makes me tremble. And they ask him, saying, Master, Luke 21 7. And they ask him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be and what sign will there be when these things come to pass. First two words out of his mouth are the title of our lesson today. And he said, what are the two words? 
be very careful. If I was to give you one verse to summarize the responsibility of your soul to God in such a drastic hour as this, it would be 2 Corinthians 4.18. What does that say? It says, while we look not at the things which are seen, corporate America has taken over the nation. They are out to destroy the middle class. They want there to be nothing but the filthy rich and the desperately poor. They have destroyed the borders and the ports of this nation. They've destroyed the security of this nation. And they have totally thrown out the Constitution to bring in illegal aliens and given them everything that they possibly can, given them to bankrupt this nation so that the middle class cannot survive. And then what monies we did have left over, they have taken it and, and invested millions of dollars per minute in a war that's going nowhere, that has lasted longer than the Second World War already, and our coffers are getting empty. And if you ain't feeling the crunch, you're doing a whole lot better than the rest of us. But the kingdoms of this world don't belong to the political boys or to the corporate fellows. The kingdoms of this world belong unto our Lord and to his Christ forever. This is the will of God. All right, this is the kind of day you're living in. You are not now living in the America in which you were born. I don't care how, how young you are. You are not now living in the America in which you are born. You are now living in post-Christian America. It is more popular to speak of any other God except Jesus. Listen, it is now more popular to trash Jesus and speak well of Mohammed. It is more popular to go with the Eastern occult religions than it is to stay with this old butcher shop religion, they call it, of the Holy God. You are in the minority. And their soul, it's coming down fast around your ears. And God is going to tell us today, get to it, preacher. I'm trying. Pray for me. And he said, verse 8, take heed that ye be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, and how shall they come? Saying, they will come through the gate of your ear, the gateway to your heart, through your ear. Saying two things. Number one, I am Christ. I am the anointed one. And number two, they will come saying, the time draweth near. Now boys, you disciples, listen to me. Go ye not therefore after them. Now that's said to the disciples in their day and age. But when, next three words, ye shall hear. Here we go again. What are we hearing? We're hearing the dragon open his mouth and spew out a flood of false doctrine. Our brother quoted this morning, first uh, John 2 18 there are many antichrists in this world there is a broad way the way of psychology 101 is filling up mega churches with thousands of people that are not even being dealt with concerning their transgression before God or of God's mercy concerning that transgression they are getting to be richer than anybody could imagine and religion is a big business that today, but spirituality is on the back row, if it even gets in the building. Listen. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified. For these things must first come to pass, but, listen, but the end is not by and by. You're going to have these things happen immediately to you disciples. And I want you to understand that in the inclusion of the destruction of that temple, with wars from Rome and wars from all kinds 
uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, the, I can't think of nothing but nomads. I'm talking about the, all the tribes around, the Germanic tribes and so forth, coming in, all those wars, everything. But I want you to know, don't look at the destruction of even religious, and may I call it a relic, now and say this is God's timetable. It's not. If the law is passed that uh, Christianity is outlawed in America and we are endangering our lives to meet together and they come and confiscate this land, that's not a timetable of God. God hasn't changed with you. God is still who he said he was. He's still with you. It doesn't make any difference if you have the glorious temple or you don't have the, the glorious temple of Herod. You have the temple of the Holy Ghost, which ye are. And God will meet with you whether there's two or three. God will meet with you. And you are not to look at all this stuff going on. Let me remind you, the prophet came out to the, to the mouth of the cave. And the Lord said, what doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, you know, Lord, I'm the only Christian left on planet Earth. He said, well, let me show you something. He sent an earthquake, shaking all things that could be shaken. And Elijah looked and he said, there's a lot of shaking going on in religion, a lot of shaking going on in, in government. A lot of shaking and turmoil going on in Israel right now. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then he sent a big fire. And man, he said, look at that thing. Wow. I-95 had to be shut down. The whole swamp is, a, is ablaze. Half of Florida and, 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 and most of South Georgia is ablaze. Smoke's everywhere. It's amazing. It's changed the whole pattern of life here. But... The Lord was not in the fire. Are you with me? And then there came what the Amplified calls the voice of silent stillness. The King James says the still, small voice of God, and that's when the prophet cloaked himself because he knew that was God speaking to his heart. Dear soul, you're going to see the fires, the ragings and the wrath and the changings of status quo. You're going to hear the earthquakes, the shaking of things. China will be America's boss, supervisor, owner, whatever you say. China is already owning us. Go to Walmart and buy me one thing that don't say made in China. They own, dear soul, the major part of our national debt, and if they were to call it in and we had to pay it, we'd have to just stick out our hand and let them handcuff us and carry us all off to debtor's prison. It's already happened, and it happened without firing a shot. Nobody even knows it. You are already in the destruction of the status quo. But, dear soul, it's not. And one day we're going to wake up because... Up to this point, the foreigners have, have not infiltrated and said, we're going to do away with your way of life yet, as far as anything official or political, but that's going to come. But the thing that I want you to know, it is not by might, it is not by the world's power, but it's by my still small voice, saith the Lord. Can I ask you a question? How did you get this far in life? How did you get this far in life? You hadn't, you hadn't always been under this ministry. You haven't always been gathered together with these folks. You, you haven't always had uh, all that you have now that you say is that which guides you today. How did you get here? By the Holy Ghost. And what did the songwriter say? It's grace that led me safe this far, and grace will lead me home. That's all you need to get out of this lesson today. 
It doesn't matter if they tear down the Capitol and steal the gold off of it up there in Atlanta, Georgia. It doesn't matter if they tear down the White House and tear down Washington Monument and, and, and tear down the, the, the Senate and all. It doesn't make any difference, dear friend, if the way of life that you have been raised up in never is seen by you again. You still have the same God dealing with you in the same way that he's always dealt with you in. That's the lesson. That's the lesson. You shall hear impostors saying, I'm Christ. It's not in the religious arena. Who cares? Let them get richer. It doesn't make any difference. I'm not up here to preach against. I'm up here to preach for Christ. That's not the issue. Go ye not after them. Don't make, any, uh, uh, don't make any effort to do anything about it. Leave it alone. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars and commotions, be not terrified. Yes, these things must come, but the end is not yet. Then he said in verse 10 unto them, Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places. And I don't think that's just physical. I think, dear soul, that it's also including spiritual, and I can show it to you in Hebrews chapter 10, along about verse 29 through and 30, somewhere in there. Great earthquakes shall be in various places, famines, a famine not of bread and water, Amos chapter 8, but of hearing of the word of God, pestilences, the grievous uh, sores and diseases that men's souls get, for the way of the transgressor is hard. And fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. The structures seemingly of the, uh, of the spiritual magnitude shall even be changed. The devil shall be given voice. He shall perform miracles according to uh, Revelation chapter 13. The powers of darkness shall do all that he can in that God has sent forth the strong delusion that men who no longer will go along uh, and become pat compatible with structured uh, uh, religious tradition will be sent strong delusion by God to believe a lie that they might be damned. But who's going to who's going to deliver the deception for them? The devil himself. And it's going to look like that God has left us and God's way is a lie and the devil's way is the right way because everybody believes in it and they even got power to bring it to pass. But it's God that sent the strong delusion because of what? They receive not the love of the truth. Don't pay any attention to it. Listen, verse 12, in verse number 9, he said, these things must first come. But in verse 12, it says, but before all these. Verses 9 through 11 then seem to be those things that will happen after the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. Those things in verse 8 seem to be those immediate things that he would have his apostles know that there would come false Christ and, and, and there would be the, the preaching of the time draweth near. And, and Paul had to deal with it. How say some of you uh, that the resurrection is already past? You remember that? He preached to them. He, he preached to him and said, how is it that some of you say uh, that, that it's already passed, that there is no resurrection? And, and that, that, was already, uh, that was already permeating their society. He said, those things uh, must first come, but before all this, and beginning in verse 12 and on down, you begin to see some of the things that were going to happen to the Jews uh, on an immediate basis. Verse 12. Luke 21, but before all these, they shall lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the what? Synagogue. That's a Jewish thing, isn't it? So before these wars and rumors of wars, nations and all of this, 
and earthquakes and pestilences in, 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 the, in the arena of the time after the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Before those things happen, here's what's going to happen to you disciples. There's going to be persecution delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. You only have to read Acts chapter 9. Go ahead and anoint uh, 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 Saul of Tarsus, uh, Ananias. I want to show him what great things he must suffer for my sake, for he shall have to go before kings and testify uh, uh, of, of my grace. And he says, and it shall turn to you for a testimony. Now, in verse 14, we have settled hearts. Settle it, therefore, in your hearts. In verse 26, we have fainting hearts. Men's hearts fainting, uh, failing them for fear. And in verse number 34, we have overcharged hearts. At any time, your hearts be overcharged. These are some of the things you're going to have to deal with within yourself. So the Lord clearly teaches us, take heed. It's your heart that you need to give credence to and give attention to and not the change in the world. Ooh, did you see the moon last night? It looked like blood. Oh, here's Dr. Bottle Stopper's book on the moon shall turn to blood. The only thing you're going to do if you buy that book is make him rich. Is that right? Take heed. Take heed. Proverbs 4. I, I'm going to have to get into preaching this before I get into the preaching of it. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Would you read me three words after I read you three? Proverbs 4, 23. Read me three words. Keep thy heart with how much diligence? All right. Why should you keep your heart with all diligence? For out of it are... Well, wait a minute. It, it didn't say tune in to TV news broadcasts, and those that'll tell you the issues of life. You can get in a big mess with that. It'll sour your stomach, and you won't be able to swallow your supper, and you, you get stomach cramps and won't be able to sleep at night. Where are the issues of life? In your heart. God put the whole world of glory in your heart. With a heart, man believeth. Isn't that good? Your heart believeth God. Your heart keeps you in contact with God. You take heed. The problem that we have in, in chapter 21 of Luke is settled hearts, fearful hearts, and overcharged hearts. It's not what Herod's going to do. It's, it's not, dear, dear friend, what the northern hordes were going to do as they come and sacked Rome. It, it's not going to be with Cannibal and his elephants coming over the Alps. All of that is going to happen. That's not the issue. Stay out of all that. I'm not asking you to bury your hand, head in the sand like they say the ostrich does. I've never seen one do it. I've seen a lot of preachers I thought had their heads buried in the sand, but I ain't never seen an ostrich. But anyhow, dear soul, be aware of it, but be aware that God's in control of that. Amen. Isn't that good? Amen. What does God tell you to do? Proverbs 4, 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Go back to chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord. How much? How are you to keep your heart in, in 4.23? With all diligence. And, and, and how much are you supposed to trust in the Lord? In verse 5 of Proverbs 3. This old listen. It don't matter. What, 
what the Republicans or the Democrats or the independents or the senators or the Congress or the, you know, Bill Gates and all the rich guys do. I ain't trusted in Bill Gates. I ain't trusted in, in, in their soul, in, in the structure of the economical system of America. I'm trusted in God. How much? With all my heart. And lean not, not one degree, not one degree. Don't lean that much. You be straight up. Make sure that sundial is straight up. No shadow right under the Son of God, the Son of Righteousness. No shadows cast. Why? I'm, I'm top dead center of trusting God. And I ain't leaning and making shatters. Oh, what if? You can what if yourself into a graveyard, dear soul. You can what if yourself into sinful anxiety. You need to trust God with all your heart. You need not to lean to thine own understanding. Listen at the next verse. In all thy ways acknowledge him and what's the, what's, what's the benefit? He shall direct thy paths. What was it said in the prayer uh, prior to the lesson today? What did the brother pray in the prayer? You're too wise to make a mistake. Isn't that good? God's too wise to make a mistake. Who do you want rule in your life? The news commentator, Dr. Bottle Stopper's books, the guy in the White House, the man on the Senate floor, or the Lord Jesus Christ. Settle it. You will see devastation to the American way of life like you've never seen. And by the way, it's already happening, it's already happened, it's already started, and people can't see it. But dear soul, I want you to understand, God changes not. It does not mean that God has given up on you or has, 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 has voided his contract with you through the blood of the Lamb of God. God is still God, and if you want to know why we have a, a eight and a half by 14 sheet to try to get all of the prayer requests on it is because God is already trying, not trying, God is already bringing down upon his people the afflictions that they need, which are the beginnings of sorrows in order that they might get used to not having everything their way, but understanding things can go completely opposite of my way, but it doesn't make any difference. I'm not trusting in the value of the American dollar. I'm not trusting in my health. I'm not trusting in how much other people like or dislike me. I'm not trusting in my job. I'm trusting in the Lord God Almighty and come hell or high water, with or without disease, with or without finances, with or without everybody else's appreciation of me, Dear soul, I am all right because I'm trusting in the Lord. Isn't that good? This is a lesson God's teaching. He didn't say, boys, if you see the temple tore down, take heed. He said, the temple's going to be tore down. We're through this. We who? God the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. The temple is, is, is it, it's old news. We're through this. Everything's going to be changed. And I mean everything. And he says, but take heed to your heart. That's the lesson for today. All right, let's go back to Luke 21. Settle it, verse 14, therefore in your hearts, not to meditate, before what you shall answer. Now, this is not given to justify an old lazy preacher or an old lazy Bible teacher. This is saying if you are brought before kings 
and rulers for God's namesake in the days of the destruction of the Jewish temple before all these, before it gets out on, on out into the world beyond Jerusalem. If you are in that day and age and you are called up before rulers for his namesake, he said in verse 13, I promise you it will turn to you for an opportunity to testify. It shall be an occasion that shall serve you, 1 Samuel 10 and verse number 7. What are you supposed to do? Settle it, therefore, in your hearts not to meditate before what you shall answer. For I will give you a mouth, and I will give you wisdom. What more could you ask for? Which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. They won't have an answer to come back on or be able to resist it. And I want you to know how bad it's going to be. You shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends. When religion gets to be a family-oriented uh, entity, dear soul, and you become a Christian in the middle of that, you got problems. The one thing I beg God all my ministry is don't ever let me pastor a church that is named after a man. Because I do not want to have anything to do with the Smith Memorial Baptist Church. I don't even know if there is one. Don't blame me. I just picked that out of the midair. If there is a Smith Memorial Baptist Church, I don't want anything to do with it. Because, dear soul, if you try to be a Christian in amongst that bunch, you are going to offend family tradition, and they're coming after you. And your foes will be they of your own household. And what kind of religious order did the Jews have? It was passed down from father to son, from generation to generation. The property they owned was in accordance to their religion. You can't sell it. If you have a slave or brother that's poor and you hired him and, 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 and he, he had to lose everything he had, seventh year, you had to give him back his land and give him back his freedom and turn him back loose in order that the, the Messiah's name would be carried on. It was a family-oriented thing. And God said, be careful. Take heed. Your foes shall be they of your own household. And you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinfolks and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all for my name's sake. Where is that church today? But there shall not a hair of your head perish. He just said they're going to be put to death in verse number 16. But then he says, a hair of your head shall not perish. He means, dear soul, that God will not Listen to what the, your enemies say about you. And even if they take your natural life, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Every part of you that is Christ's shall endure and enjoy everlasting life, no matter if the physical body is destroyed. And in your patience possess ye your souls. Oh, dear soul, you've got to endure this. It's getting to be popular to murder oneself in our nation. Our brother down in Louisiana said they had five funerals regarding those over at the air base of people that has committed suicide just in the last several weeks. Every time you turn around, somebody else in one of the families or one of the men themselves that work on the air base was killing themselves. It's got to be popular today. And God said, I'll tell you something. That's because they hate me, therefore they love death. Read the last two verses of Proverbs chapter 8. And I want to tell you something, dear soul. The devil has got us in a mess when the only way out and the mindset of those who once were Christians. It has now come to the place that the only way out is self-annihilation. 
God said, I'll be with you all the way, even to the end of the world. I will sustain you. I will take care of you. I don't care if they tear down your most prized religious relic. Give it up. Give it over. Trust in God. Stay the course. Abide faithful. And I will give you overcoming endurance, and you shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's what he's saying to him, dear soul. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, know then that the desolation thereof is nigh. Let them which were, are in Judea in 70 AD when Titus the Roman general comes in to level Jerusalem, let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these days, watch it now, are the what? Days of vengeance. Give me another verse with the word vengeance in it, and it starts off the verse. Vengeance is mine. Whoa, wait a minute. Who said that? Vengeance is mine. Oh, saith the Lord. Then what you're dealing with here is days of vengeance, and vengeance belongs exclusively to God. So then, these upheavals and these destructions and the annihilations of the relics of, of, of religion that had once been used in a positive way, they were now obsolete. And now they were lodestones around the necks of those men in that city that trusted more in that building than they did in the body of Jesus Christ. And he told them, tear down this building, and I'll raise it up again the third day, but this spake he of his body, John 2 and verse 22. Who is it that's doing this? It's the days of vengeance. God's doing it. You say, well, you know, if I'd have known it was God and not the devil, I would have been faithful. Well, I'm, that's why I'm coming over here to tell you that. It was the Lord. Dear soul, as the gospel has gone from nation to nation, you can see the beginning of the nation floundering around, overcoming odds by the mercy and grace of God, becoming strong in the Lord, getting prosperous physically, which is a bad thing, because the other generations who didn't have to war in that and didn't have to believe God so strongly, they get to enjoy so much the blessings, physical blessings, and begin to equate gain to be godliness. And so it is in America today. You can't find uh, 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 an American hardly, dear soul, that is not intoxicated on the whore's wine that God is seen to be in your life because you've got a lot of stuff. They think that gain, getting stuff, is godliness. And I really, sw I, I really believe I have actually seen some of them standing in the line, me just wanting to pay for my $15 a gallon gas, standing there praying, help me win the lottery, Jesus. Why don't you just go on and pray, help me go to hell, Jesus, because it's hard for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor, for God hath chosen the poor of this world rich in faith. We are in a mess. You can't hardly find a person that's, that's not brainwashed and intoxicated on the whore's wine that has any clarity and sobriety of thought and heart to be able to talk to them about God anymore. God said, it's the days of vengeance. I'm doing this. I am doing this. Listen. Listen. For these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days, the days of the destruction of, of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., 
For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath. Whose wrath do you think that is? The same one that controls vengeance. It's God's wrath. Wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. That happened. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. All right. Now, here comes the church age. And there shall be signs in the sun. Revelation 12, who is the sun? The S-O-N of God, the son of God, the center of our universe. There shall be signs in the moon. Who was it was identified with the moon in Revelation chapter 12? She was standing on the moon and had the stars in her hair. The church. It's going to turn spiritual. And in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations. God is going to have the gospel bring distress to nations with perplexity. There's going to be upheavals, the sea, and, and that's the masses of humanity. And the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. It's the gospel age then beginning with verse number 25. Oh, my soul, take thing, take heed with what you hear. Take heed, understand this. It's God that's doing it and not those who have that sword in their hand. It's not those, dear friend, who have the finances of America and have stolen in and captured everything we got because of the greed in America, our scientists, uh, our manufacturers, we have sold out lock, stock, and barrel to China. We've sold them all of our secrets. We've sold them all of our securities. We have actually sold everything we have, our heart and soul in this nation, dear soul, because of the almighty dollar. And the one thing that God turned loose on this nation to destroy it is G-R-E-E-D. Greed. And I want to ask you a question. What is the root of all evil? The love of money. And why did God send them strong delusion? Because they would not receive the love of the truth. Aha. Uh -huh. They had the love of the truth, but they didn't want it. Now they want the love of money, and God's given it to them. So it's going to be the root of all evil. That's where we are in America, dear friend. And God is telling you today, do not concern yourself about the drastic lifestyle changes that's going to be upon the American public. Do not expect God to undo it, to reverse it. He don't, if he told us, told us to forget those things which are behind, he ain't going to turn around and go back either. He's going to press forward because God's not concerned about the present day. He's concerned about the future glory. The present day of grace is only for the future day of glory. And dear soul, this thing's going to go ahead and blossom and, and bud and go into the fuel, full blossom of God's glory. And that's what God's doing. And there's so he left England behind. He left Germany behind. That's where Mr. Luther was. Am I right? He left Jerusalem behind. And you better mark it down. He's going to leave your fair America behind because the kingdoms of this world are fastly becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign. What, what word do I have for you then to come over here and help you with the destruction of your nation and your lifestyle? Two words. Take heed. Take heed to what? To your heart. Legislation's not going to stop this. Education is not going to uh, stem this tide. But faith is the victory that overcometh the world. Uh, 
Lord, can I speak to Noah a minute? Yeah, here he is. Hey, Noah, they're having floods up there in Missouri. If he's going to go to Missouri, Lord willing, next week. And having floods up there at Merrimack River, just, it just gets out everywhere. Uh, how'd you do? He said, the flood I had make that Merrimack River look like a mud puddle. Now, how'd you do? I did fine. How'd you, how'd you make it through it? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Well, well, Noah, bring Peter over here. I mean, I want to ask him a question about your day. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Peter, didn't you write something about Noah's day? Yeah. What did you say? The world that then was perished. You're talking about a different map. You're talking about a different atlas. You're talking about a different globe. When God uh, pulled the stopper out of the bathtub of the fountains of the great deep, and when God uh, ripped open the, 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 the windows of heaven and let water come from below and above, it burst, it burst continents asunder. It changed the whole world. It set the world's axis on a different degree. This so whole, we don't even have the world that Noah lived in. How you doing, Noah? Doing fine. How'd you make it? Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. How'd you, how'd you get through? I took heed to my heart. Is that good? Wow. Oh, my soul. Let me see if I can finish reading this. I don't look like I'm going to get to preaching. I'm just going to go to reading. Verse 27. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud. And that don't mean a cumulus or a whatever they are. It don't mean a fluffy, uh, a fluffy bunch of atmosphere, a moisture in the heavens. It means Glory. Clouds of glory. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, would you read me the next three words and accent the first one real hard? Amen. He didn't say stop and watch... The stone's being tore down. Brother Earl told me about the day they tore down Bethlehem Baptist Church building. Him and Idell went up there and, and sat across the street in the pickup and watched them tore down, tear down the building where Bethlehem Baptist Church met. And I know that had to be hard to watch. But you know what? They took a licking but they went right on ticking. You know why? Like the heroes of the faith in Hebrews chapter 11, Moses endured the wrath of the king as seeing him who is invisible. There's enough upheaval in the lives sitting right here. Just take that one pastor's wife back there. All the stuff she's had to endure and where did she want to be this morning? I want to go to church. It sure wasn't because of the one you got in the pulpit over here. It's because God has been her supply and her help through everything she's ever had to endure. And that's, that's a story told over and over again by all of you here. And dear soul, it was grace that helped you make it safe thus far Give me the rest of it. And grace will lead us home. That's my message today. My time's gone. I got a lot of details evidently to give you this afternoon. A lot of details. <laughs> I didn't even get to it. Just trying to read it to you and express it to you. But there's so listen. It doesn't make any difference what happens to the population of this nation or the population of this globe. It matters, did Jesus save your soul? And did Jesus say, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world? 
And did Jesus say, I will be with you all the way, even to the end of the world? And did Jesus say, if you believe on me, you shall not perish? Then it doesn't matter what the Atlanta Journal of Constitution has on the front page tomorrow. It matters on, on what the front page of the gospel is in your heart. And as Jesus took care of you thus far, can anybody raise their hand and say, there's a time when I needed Jesus and he didn't help me? Has there ever been a testimony throughout the entire earth age where you can find one true Christian who says, God lied to me and he didn't do what he said he would do? Not a one. In fact, it says, I have, I, I have been young and now am I, I, I'm old. And you want to know something I didn't ever see? I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. For if God delivered up his only son, how shall he not with him freely give you all things? Romans 8, 32. Father, we have fumbled around. We have staggered around. We have stalled around. But we read the scriptures. The simplicity of the message title has been put into our hearts and minds by this poor excuse for a pastor. But Lord, you have opened up to some degree, and I trust a greater degree than I could ever imagine, to the hearts and minds of your people. That status quo is not promised them in the world. And status quo is not really promised them in the spiritual realm but the spiritual way at Ram shall not continue idly in the same position, but it shall grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. It shall go on into the presence of eternal glory. It will not stand still. It will not lag behind. God is ever, ever educating, increasing, uplifting, giving, uh, giving raises, permeating uh, uh, portions of hearts and minds it, with truth and life that they had not had before. Jesus Christ is becoming more precious and real to every soul every day that's in the kingdom. The world will be constantly become torn down and it will be destructing but the kingdom of God will be ever building up and God will ever come closer to us until such time as we shall see him as he is and then we shall be like him and he shall change our vile body into the likeness of his glorious body and the things of the world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. Be with God's people today. Help us, Lord, that we might have our eyes and hearts centered upon Christ, for we ask these things for his glory's sake. Amen. Let us do something for your soul to know that, that God surely still has a prophet in, in his Israel to bring us an antidote to fear and unbelief this morning. Thank you, Lord, for that. Let's stand together and sing number 347. 347. <clears throat> Be 
Be still, my soul, thy God doth undertake to guide the future as he has the past. Thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake. Shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul. The waves and winds still know his voice to rule them while he dwelt below. Be still, my soul. Jamie, would you dismiss us, please? Heavenly Father, oh God, we give thanks, Lord, for your telling us of the things that will come to pass before they come to pass. God, that we will not be shaken. Yes. Lord, every, every kingdom, God, that has ever stood against you, Lord, that has ever turned away, from thee that has rebelled against you, Lord, in, in spite of your great mercy. Lord, that kingdom has fallen. And Lord, I pray that we would not put our hope and trust in the kingdoms of this world. Yes. But God, that we would understand that they are become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. Yes. And oh God, that you and you alone would be our hope. Yes. Lord, truly, we are poor and needy, but praise God, you think upon us. Yes. <clears throat> Lord, we just want to glorify you this day. We give thanks, Lord God, for what you've already said and look forward to that which you would say further. May you be glorified and, and encourage our hearts, Lord, in the truth. Lord, uh, remove the, um, God, anything that's been clouded in our minds over the years by religion and show us the purity of thy word. Reveal the Lord Jesus to us. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.